with age, we know kidney function declines. And so it's not shocking that if you kind of overwhelm the system with a metabolite supplement that has to be detoxified, that that could lead to kidney damage, kidney inflammation, kidney failure, specifically in aged animals. Yep. Right. That's and true. and so I think it's a very plausible case. And this, you know, this is maybe worth thinking about beyond just NAD precursors in general with supplements for people who are aged or for people who have, are predisposed to kidney dysfunction, um, taking non-physiological doses of almost anything could potentially exacerbate kidney failure. And so that's my intuition for what's happening here. Right. Cause it's, it's uh, one of your organs that's kind of mainly involved in detoxification, clearing out bad metabolites, filtering things out of the blood. Right. So I guess that could be maybe a reason why you see a difference between liver and kidney. Um, but it's hard to say. The, the, why Why do you see this in the kidney versus the liver? Is yeah. The yeah. And again, I mean, I think this may be where mice are because, because they are probably more susceptible to kidney failure than liver failure during aging. Different animals, different that's organs true. and tissues are more susceptible to, to failure. I think that's true, that, that, that when you look functionally, kidney tends to be more dysfunctional than liver with aging in mice. So that could be part of it. I will say the liver stuff is interesting. So, you know, we only did a very little bit in my lab with NAD precursors, um, and we never could convince ourselves with NMN or NR in mice that we could boost NAD substantially anywhere but in the livers. But in the livers, you get a massive, massive oh, boost in NAD. So I think the liver is the first place, which makes sense, uh -huh. where nicotinamide or niacin that are taken up through the gut go to be converted into NAD. And probably it's also in the liver where that NAD is then being broken back down into nicotinamide and converted into these other metabolites. Although maybe not, maybe that happens elsewhere. Yeah, but I mean, it might be since the liver is kind of a process, a meta metabolic processing hub, You, it, it has a higher tolerance for high NAM or NAD yeah, loads and that, that you don't get sense, these toxic right? byproducts maybe as much as you would in another tissue. So maybe yeah. that could be- Although I think we should be careful about calling them toxic byproducts. They're, they can be toxic in some cases, they can be important intermediates in others. I think we don't that, really That's know, fair, right? okay. So they're using them as kind of a sign of damage in this case, right. but yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, so let's dive into the metabolites now, because this is where they focused to try to figure out, you know, what's going on in the kidneys of these animals. So what they did was they did metabolomics, uh, circulating metabolomics, so blood or plasma, I can't remember which, um, and looked for differences between the, the groups, right? The, the young versus old or the old treated with ELAM alone, NMN alone, or the combination. And they found several things that were different. Again, lots in the paper, but I thought these were the ones that were most intriguing and they were the ones that they sort of picked up on. So the big one here is methyl nicotinamide. So this is a known uh, product of uh, nicotinamide where it gets methylated and gets converted into this one methyl nicotinamide uh, metabolite, which then is eventually cleared by the kidney, but has all sorts of potentially interesting biochemical and signaling properties. And, and if you look in the literature, I wasn't really familiar with this. There's actually studies suggesting beneficial effects of one methyl nicotinamide, or at least correlated with positive outcomes in kidney disease, negative outcomes in kidney disease. So it's kind of unclear, is this a good molecule or a bad molecule, as much as any molecule is good or bad. Um, it's unclear to me what it means that you see very high levels of methyl nicotinamide um, in the NMN treated mice, but you do. And I think it's very clear from this figure, just even looking at the young animals, there's a big increase in methyl nicotinamide from NMN, not from ELAM. Same thing happening in the old animals, um, that this is clearly an effect of the NMN treatment. And again, very biologically plausible, given that we know that this is a byproduct of having too much nicotinamide. Right. And uh, in those previous studies where they've looked at this, I assume those were in young mice and not old mice as well. That's right. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. Um, so that's important. Uh, very important consideration is that if methyl nicotinamide or these other two byproducts of methyl nicotinamide, N-methyl-6-PY and N-methyl-4-PY, um, if those are 
detrimental in this case, causally detrimental for the kidney damage, that again could be specific to the aged kidney and not seen in a young kidney. Right, which is one of the suggestions they make in the paper. Yep. Yep. So, and it is the case that in uh, kidney disease, in people even, you do see higher levels of these three metabolites in the urine. So consistent with the idea that these are at least biomarkers of kidney dysfunction, potentially kidney failure, yep. and possibly causing or contributing to kidney dysfunction or kidney failure. Okay, so they didn't actually resolve that. They proposed that these molecules are being generated probably in the liver, but maybe not, maybe in the kidney. Yep and that they are contributing to the kidney failure, kidney dysfunction, or at least kidney inflammation. Oh. So relevant to that, there is one study that found that in women taking NMN, you do see elevated levels of 1-methylnicotinamide and the 2-PY and 4-PY metabolites. Again, no evidence in that study that that was associated with or causing kidney damage, but they did detect them as being elevated. So right. certainly consistent with the data here that that elevation of those downstream metabolites byproducts of nicotinamide occurs in people or at least in women probably in men too taking nicotinamide mononucleotide that was at 250 milligrams a day for 10 weeks so you know a dose that some people out there are taking right now okay so it is worth mentioning that uh, uh that these markers are considered uremic toxins associated with kidney damage uh, and chronic kidney disease. Um, so, you know, again, is it causal here? Don't know, but there's at least some smoke, right? Yes. And so I would say worth uh, further study. So here is the model they proposed that NMN gets converted in the liver to, to one methyl nicotinamide. They didn't actually show this happens in the liver, but it can happen in the liver. That one methyl nicotinamide and potentially its byproducts go to the kidney, have to be detoxified by the kidney, and that contributes to kidney inflammation, and that's what's driving potentially the kidney damage, and that ELAM is at least partially protective through presumably a mitochondrial mechanism. So the authors fully own that this is very speculative. They've only shown a few pieces of this model, certainly a model that is worth further testing, I would say, at this point. Yeah, and I agree that one of the things I liked about the paper was that they were not over-interpreting the results. They were right. trying to kind of show it and suggest some things, but we're not like saying this is the end. Right. And there's a couple of other things that the, the authors wrote that I just want to read because, again, I think they stated it in a very, very clear and precise way. So one of the things they talked about was the dosing. If the dosing of NMN in the drinking water of our study were allometrically scaled for human consumption, it would be approximately 1.5 grams per day. This is higher than what has been used in human clinical trials. Although I just mentioned at 250 mg a day, you saw markers for 1-methyl nicotinamide in the downstream uh, NPY products. Um, so that is higher than what has been used in human clinical trials, but is consistent with at least six other studies using oral NMN delivery in mice in a range between 300 and 500 mg per kg body weight. So again, they use 300 towards the lower end of what's been previously used in mouse studies and not super far out of the range for what people potentially could be supplementing at. Um, they also say, furthermore, this dosing of NMN is still a more realistic model for the potential for excessive self-dosing, which we know some people do, yep. which is enabled by the current availability of many NAD precursors as over-the-counter supplements. So I guess my view is this is pretty suggestive maybe strongly suggestive that NMN can cause kidney damage, at least kidney inflammation, specifically in aged mice, um, maybe induces senescence, increases kidney injury markers. As we've already talked about, they didn't actually show changes in kidney function. Yep. That's the, the big missing piece here. And of course, more research is needed to know how general this is. Is it going to be true in other mouse backgrounds? Is it yep. going, Are there male, female sex effects here? Um, dosage effects, all of that you know, is very unclear at this point. But having said all of that, I think as the authors correctly conclude, this really warrants caution in the use of NAD precursors in aged people. And I would suggest in aged companion animals. Um, there are companies now selling NAD precursors for use in dogs and cats with absolutely no data for benefits. I would be very concerned based on this study that you could exacerbate kidney disease in your companion animal if you give them NAD precursors. And the people selling these things really should 
make sure that you're not going to hurt anybody or anybody's pets. Yeah, that was going to be a question. Do you know of any studies in academia or not behind these companies uh, who are selling this stuff uh, that are testing NAD precursors in dogs that might uh, have kidney function as a potential metric they could look at? I don't. Um, so the again, the only clinical trial that I am aware of, I did an episode on on the podcast uh, a while back where they, this was done out of the University of North Carolina, where they were assessing um, the effects of a product that supposedly was an NAD booster yep. on cognitive function. They didn't actually say what was in the product. Right. <laughs> so we don't actually know. They didn't show that NAD was boosted. It also did not improve cognitive function when you actually analyze the data with any type of reasonable statistical um, approach. So that was kind of a nothing burger study right. that, you know, the company made a big deal out of in a press release in a very dishonest way, in my opinion. Um, but no, I don't know of anybody who's looking at it. And unfortunately, I have not, um, I have actually not seen any of the NAD supplement sellers respond to this preprint. They really should. Because yep. again, I think this is pretty compelling that 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 this could be a problem. Right. And, you know, granted, I get that it's not against the law to sell this stuff, but if you have a reasonable expectation that it could cause harm, right? I would argue that anybody who's, being ethical should consider that before, or at least, at least make it clear to people who are buying your product that there's the potential for harm instead of claiming efficacy that doesn't exist. Right. At, at least make people aware that there's, there is some evidence out there. Right. Um, and again, I think we've been pretty clear. This paper falls far short from demonstrating that yes. NAD precursors cause kidney disease, but there's a, there's some smoke there right. and it's a biologically plausible mechanism for inducing kidney damage or kidney inflammation. Yeah. 